Hateful far-right populist movements are spreading their anti-immigrant extreme views, poisoning societies across continents. At least that's the message of those who oppose them, those who hate the haters. Who's telling the truth? This is Roundtable with me, David Foster. Welcome to the programme. Acting in concert, it is claimed that far-right groups in the US, the UK, across Europe have an international agenda. If that is the case, what is the agenda? Where is the evidence? And if true, is it an unstoppable juggernaut? Far-right movements in the US and UK are gaining traction. It was a driving force behind Britain's vote to leave the European Union and Donald Trump's campaign to win the US presidential election. But are the two movements linked? Is there a connection between far-right politics on both sides of the Atlantic? Tommy Robinson, born Stephen Yaxley Lennon, is a far-right activist in Britain. He was the founder of the English Defence League, an organisation that campaigns against Islamic extremism. I'm not a racist, I'm not a fascist, I'm far from it. So if the best argument you've got is to say racist, fascist, rather than deal with the problem or talk about the problem, which is militant Islam, everyone's trying to pretend we're the problem, we're a reaction to actions that are going on in this country. For the most part of 10 years, he's only really been known in Britain. But a court case in Leeds changed that after he was jailed for breaking reporting restrictions. His live streaming of events outside was deemed a contempt of court, which could prejudice the case. He was sentenced to 13 months in prison. In America, Robinson's story has been reported as one of injustice. His supporters say he was punished for broadcasting unpopular views. Now, some have likened him to a suffragette for right-wing politics. Over 630,000 people signed a petition for his release. Protests took place across Britain and campaigns under the Free Tommy banner exploded online. One of the biggest names to come forward in Robinson's defence was Steve Bannon, a former advisor to President Trump. Bannon said Robinson was the backbone of the country on a radio show hosted by the former leader of Britain's right-wing party, UKIP. Weeks later, Robinson was freed on bail, pending a retrial. Has this high-profile endorsement revealed a deeper level of far-right cooperation between the US and UK? Bannon is reportedly setting up a foundation to spread far-right political groups across Europe. He's already met with some of Europe's far-right leaders, such as France's Marine Le Pen. And he says he's aiming to establish a right-wing supergroup within the European Parliament. The movement, as it's called, is expected to set up its own headquarters in Brussels ahead of the European parliamentary elections next year. Tommy Robinson's imprisonment in the UK has become a focus point for the far-right movement. It's moved the debate from Britain to America and beyond. Has it empowered two separate far-right movements in two separate countries to link up? And if so, has the far-right moved into the mainstream? So, very good to have your company for this programme. Also, to welcome via Skype from Ohio, we have Tom Sutton, a Professor of Political Science at Baldwin Wallace University, and with me at the round table. John O'Connell, UK founder of Far Right Watch, Shaista Aziz, journalist and equalities campaigner, and Paul Jackson, who is a lecturer in history at Northampton University. Um, good to see each one of you. Tom, let me come to you first of all. Do you believe there is a growing connection between international far right groups? Uh, yes, I do, uh, particularly when you see the activities of Steve Bannon, uh, supporters of some of the other groups, Daniel Pipes, um, Frank Gaffney, each of their foundations. They link money from the United States with groups and groups across to the European continent, in particular uh, Great Britain. And I think these connections are growing stronger. In some ways, they parallel other political connections that we see with political consultants that help with elections, 
It's the same kind of track, but in this case, of course, it is to link these far-right ideolo ideologies to legitimize them, to make them normalized, and to get them into the mainstream of the electoral process in all of these countries. Yeah, yeah. Daniel Pipes, who you mentioned, I think is from the Middle East Forum, the group that paid Tommy Robinson's legal fees. Yeah? Yes. Yes, indeed. Okay, so and what, they've been around for about 30 years. Did you think this is um, a deliberate attempt to unify um, a far-right movement, if you like, or is it just organic because of the way that the world works these days? I think, it's a leg I think it's a legitimate attempt not to unify, but really to strengthen and grow these networks and to learn from each other. Quite frankly, there are some tensions between these. I think to go to the United States and say to these groups, we want to unite with the groups in Europe, in France, in Britain, et cetera, might actually create division. So I think it's being done quietly. It's being done behind the scenes. It's where the media becomes so important to try to reveal this. But really, I think it is about pushing an ideology into the mainstream, into elections, and trying to convince people that really separatism, this kind of fear of Islam as a terrorist threat are the kinds uh, of things that they're... OK, J John, Far Right Watch, hmm. your group. I wonder, A, have you noticed what is being suggested by Tom? But secondly, what these disparate groups might have in common? I think we started noticing a couple of years ago, uh, perhaps three years ago, um, groups like us, Hope Not Hate, um, Stonewall, various groups started seeing a, a trend of far-right groups at every level, from activists in the street up to political parties, starting to coordinate, starting to share resources, techniques, methods, data as well. Um, as far as sharing an agenda, um, there are some people who say one of the key agendas, certainly in Europe, is to destabilize the European Union. And most far-right groups and parties in Europe uh, have that as one of their key agendas. It may well be purely because they think they can attract support through that method. But Steve Bannon's uh, methodology now with this new group, he's setting up the foundation, the key primary methodology is to destable the European Union. And you said that this week that group has rented off They've rented office, office in, in Brussels. They will probably have something between 9 and 12 staff. The key thing is where the funding is coming from this, we don't know. And because of the status of that group, they have no obligation to okay, divulge. Tell me more about your theories in, in, in just a moment. But let me come to you, Paul. Do you think this is perhaps a bit exaggerated? Am I right? I wouldn't say it's exaggerated. I think there are significant things happening. I think what we ought to be careful of is saying that all this is new. Um, I mean, I've researched the history of the far right um, uh, and teach the history of fascism too. In the interwar period, various fascist groups across Europe tried to network internationally. Mussolini put quite a lot of money into trying to make that happen. In the 1960s, there was a, a neo-Nazi network called the World Union of National Socialists that linked people up in North America, South America, Australia, Europe. Um, uh, and was driven quite a lot by activists in the UK. Uh, if we look at the 1990s, we can see a kind of a strong shared agenda between British and American neo-Nazi groups. William Pierce from America, for example, coming over and supporting the BMP. Combat 18. That's the British National Party. That's the British National yeah. Party. And Combat 18, which was a, a more violent group of the 1990s, also having links with American activists like Harold Covington. So, as I say, I think there is a transnational link up here. But it's not new. That's the key point. OK. Language is, is crucial in this one, isn't it? I mean, you, you've talked about a number of different groups, and you used the word fascist. Mm. Could you label every single one of these groups we're talking about here who no. are perhaps far right as fascists? No, you'd incorrectly do so. As a historian, uh, you know, we've got academic definitions for fascism which uh, talk about them being a revolutionary movement who want to change the political constitution and install a one-party state. You had um, um, Yakti Lenin from um, the formerly from the English Defence League, saying he wasn't a fascist. I perfectly well agree with that. He's not a fascist. He doesn't want to achieve that sort of revolution. Is Tommy Robinson a fascist? Well, that's who I was just talking oh, about. Oh, yeah, because that's his other name, of Tommy course. Robin Sorry. I mean, it should be clear. Tommy Robinson is a student he took from football hooligan culture. So, I mean, that tells you something about how he views issues of violence yeah. and casualization of violence. But no, he's not a fascist. He doesn't want to change the political constitution, nor does Marine Le Pen or many of the other populist far-right politicians in Europe, nor does Farage. So it's incorrect to call these people fascist, but they are far-right. Shaista, does it matter what they're called? I do think it, it does matter. I think we have to be really vigilant, especially as journalists and, you know, those who are shaping public opinion through the work that we do, that we 
call these people what they are. So I have an issue with this term far-right activist, all these types of terms that are suddenly emerging that kind of, for me, they don't really explain what's going on. These people are extremists. They hold extremist views. Um, many of them are violent extremists. Some of them have been... Not all of them. I said many of them. Yeah, okay. I didn't say all of Some them. Some of them many of them, um, they hold extremist ideologies and they pose a threat to democracy and they also pose a threat to minorities across Europe. Uh, we've seen an increase in anti-Semitism, we've seen an increase in Islamophobia, we've seen a normalisation of a lot of the rhetoric uh, that they use uh, which is seeping into the mainstream. So Does it lead to hate dangerous. crime? Hate crime has gone up 23% in the UK alone uh, since Brexit. To be very clear, I'm not suggesting all those instances that have been recorded are linked to the far right. That's not what I'm saying. Well, what no, I'm because I did take a look at this report and it actually said that most of them were related to something entirely different. Well, what they're related to is an involvement of racist views, um, a mainstreaming of these views, and a belief that anybody who looks different or who is other, um, you know, th that they should be, th yeah. that their legitimacy in terms of them being present in a country like Britain should be questioned. Um, so that's what's going on there. And it's having real life implications for people. And in particular, in the work that I'm doing, I'm noticing, uh, well, not that I'm noticing, I'm interviewing uh, Muslim women, visible women, who in many cases say that they're scared to go about their daily lives because of the way this discourse is becoming more and more mainstreamed. Well, I suppose what I'm trying to get at here, and, and Tom, do, do jump in because I'm going to direct this question to every single person here. Is, is, there part of a, is this part of a plan? And if it is part of a plan, whose plan is it? And where's, as you said, where's the money coming? from I mean somebody presumably has an agenda not just an individual but somebody somewhere am I right well, I think Steve Steve Bannon's a good example of somebody with an agenda Steve Bannon has a very clear plan that he's been trying to implement through the influence of these groups and it's a combination of grassroots events demonstrations building a sense of fear and also this issue of identity politics but turning it around so on the left you have identity politics identity of inclusion, identity of participation. On the far right, you have the identity of our identities being diluted, being threatened. And I think that's what Steve Bannon is promoting, combined with ardent nationalism, combined with trade protection, and combined especially with threats to national security. I don't, Thoughts? I don't think that there is one all-encompassing shared agenda in Europe. I think that uh, each far-right party, each far-right group has their own agenda for their own national aims. And they see so much of an overlap with other groups, they see the sense in coordinating and cooperation. I don't think there's one overall agenda. There is a huge overlap between all of them. They share so many of the aims and ambitions. What about this headline from British newspaper, The Independent? Well, it's online these days. A far-right extremist targeting UK as they, quote, weaponize internet culture mm -hmm. to spread hatred around the world. Mm. Yeah. One of the problems with the internet is it's, it gives a validation to even the smallest of groups. They, uh, you have a lot of groups that have relatively small presence in real life, 20, 30, 40 people. But the internet and social media gives them a very visible... Uh, presence and, and, and we social, by reporting it yes, by extension to a certain degree yes this is what he means by weaponizing magnify that mm. spotlight that's been put on I don't on agree with that at all I yeah? think the, it's about the way it's reported so for example when you have reporters reading out Donald Trump's tweets that's not analysis that's not giving us any information that we can't find for ourselves so it's actually about how these issues are being reported so that's uh, I think that more increasingly far right uh, extremists are being given uncritical media platforms to spew their bigotry without being held to account. Everybody should be held to account, including them. Do you, do you mean, well, let's, we're talking about the United States and the United Kingdom here, but I mean, I can see why perhaps sites uh, cited such as Fox News, etc., etc., mm -hmm. and Breitbart, but is it the same mm -hmm. in this country? Yes, it uncritical? is. Uncritical? I do believe there's a lot of uncritical um, platforms being given to these individuals because I think there's also a lack of understanding of how they're operating and what they're doing. So let's, let's be clear here. Um, not so long ago, a British MP was murdered by an extremist who allegedly shouted out Britain first and he's got links with far-right groups. This has taken place in the United Kingdom in the past two years. And by okay. saying that you know, the media 
if the media gives them coverage that increases that increases you know their attempts to put the propaganda out I don't think that's right I think what but, we but need it, to is it is inevitable isn't it that the way that reporting has changed in, in this country um, I think it's an interesting issue. You can compare and contrast because you, you're a historian as well. Well, I mean, if we look at kind of some of the people I've researched, say, in the, the late 1950s, it's quite interesting to see that they were given um, quite a lot of space to write their own articles, especially in the local um, uh, press of the, of the period. Uh, so the media giving space to um, right-wing extremists in Britain uh, isn't anything necessarily anything new. I kind of agree with this point that it's not that it should or shouldn't be reported, it's that it should re be reported critically. Uh, and also we should be careful not to fall into to the extreme right's own mythologizing. I told you before, you know, sort of Tommy Robinson is a name often used to describe Stephen Yaxley Lennon when that's a, a pseudonym he's adopted for campaigning purposes and a pseudonym that he adopted from football hooligan culture. So there's a whistle there to certain sectors of society. But most people don't really understand that. But um, to talk about Bannon, who we talked about as yeah. well, who's been talked about a lot in the media, I mean, he has a degree of influence and, and power, but also he has more influence and power because he's talked about so much as this Rasputin-like figure who can unify um, a quite divided uh, movement. When if for any part, reason he goes, is, is that the end of it, at the end of the momentum? Um, any evidence that that has been the case? My, my, sense is, in the past? my sense is the extreme right culture has been there for, for many generations mm. and will continue to be there for many generations. Right at the moment, we're talking about certain key people. In 10 years' time, we'll still be talking about the extreme right, but we'll be talking about different people at its head. Do, Do, people, I mean, quick, quickly, if I may. Is, is Steve Bannon the totem? in as much as it's, it's around him that so much of this is gathering and therefore we should be worried about him rather than other people. And if he went, perhaps the problem wouldn't be, if, if quotes, there is a problem, wouldn't be quite as obvious. I think he's the most obvious because of his own self-promotion and the fact that he did get himself into the Trump campaign and into the Trump White House and eventually was pushed out. But if you remove Steve Bannon from the equation, I think you're going to still have some version of these movements. And you're certainly gonna have what we saw with the Middle East Forum uh, with the Center for Security and some of these other organizations continuing to promote, really are tapping into these deep-seated elemental fears, concerns related to national security, related to national identity, that as Paul has talked about, we've had in our country going back to the early 1800s. They come and go by waves. John, you, you were trying to say something. I stopped you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, say, I just, say what you want and then I want to put a point to you. Sure, I just wanted to follow up on, on what Paul was saying. These people with these kind of far-right views have always been there. Yeah. You're never going to eradicate them. The difference now is that they've been validated. They've had their views validated. What previously they would think... By whom? By, uh, I would say, for example, by the rise of President Trump, by the Brexit result, by the rise of parties in Europe, by the rise of UKIP in the last five years. This has validated their views. What previously they thought, they now feel they can speak and even act okay, on. You, UKIP in the UK, mm. Nigel Farage, I mean, did he do this deliberately to incite what you've referred to as hate crime and then or was he was his message hijacked as no i I, th I think it was deliberate perhaps not by F nigel farage specifically but by his party yes because they knew that there was a vote out there they could catch so they knew but that, that well, this I've got kind a question of, for him first this kind of write. this kind of dog whistling would attract that kind of vote i mean their their requirement to leave the european union they may have had their own agendas, but they knew that racism was one agenda they could hijack to use for Brexit. Okay. So I think it was an agenda of UKIP, not specifically perhaps Nigel Farage. We will keep it going. It would be wrong of me to change the direction. I'll ask the question in a minute. So. Well, I was going to say, a fact that the UKIP campaign, uh, the fact that it was all around this imagery of, you know, these hordes of people, mm -hmm. swarms of people, dark-skinned people coming into the UK, um, to change the fabric of the United Kingdom is an absolute disgrace. So it was done deliberately, let's not pretend otherwise. It was absolutely manufactured to um, heighten anxiety around immigration. This is a country that is, is <coughs> ill at ease with its own history and its past. And this is another reason why these um, ideas and these ideologies are gaining traction. Okay, I was going to put this question to, to, to John, but I'll put it to you, Paul, anyway, uh, because we're talking about internationally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we noticed in our office this morning that an Australian politician called Fraser Anning, he's from the One Nation Party, mm -hmm. is asking for a plebiscite on what he termed appallingly a final solution about whether Muslims and non-English speaking people from the third world should be allowed into Australia. Now, always been here. Mm -hmm. And only now being reported, that sort of thing? Is, is, this, is this new is this, um, or is it infectious? 
Um, well, I mean, I think it's always been reported when people have made these sorts of um, uh, claims and, um, and pronouncements and so on. I mean, certainly I've kind of seen that in um, researching previous generations, you know, talking about, say, the National Front in Britain in the 1970s um, or neo-Nazi figures in Britain like Colin Jordan in the 1960s. These people were, were widely reported on and perhaps like the people today, they rather enjoyed having the media attention shone on them uh, and did things to court it. Uh, as well. So it's, it's both. It, it, it's always been around, um, but this is being, the fires are being stoked by the fact that it is infectious. You know, what you read about in the United States, what you read about in Austria, what you read about in, in the United Kingdom, etc., might have encouraged. Well, I think one of the things that, that's changed perhaps in recent times is some of the, the reporting language. I mean, for example, the term outright has been used um, in reporting in this area for the past two or three years. And I think one of the things that reporters have done when they've used the word outright is had a much greater receptiveness to the international nature uh, of uh, the extreme right or the far right or whatever you might want to call it. So perhaps what was more often reported as a national phenomenon um, um, from a political you know, sort of set of movements espousing nationalist oh. politics is now talked much more f actually in a way accurately as a transnational or international phenomenon. But I also think it's about, as I said, the way these issues are being reported. So this is what needs to be challenged. It's not that, you know, these, these ideologies have been around forever, as all the guests have already pointed out. But it's about making sure that when anyone is given a platform, yeah. they, are, they are given, you know, they, they are questioned in a way that challenges... That, you know, challenges them robustly. That's simply not happening. Tom, let me come to you. In 2016, we saw President Trump elected. Uh, some year or so later, we saw Steve Bannon ushered away from the White House. He's now doing something different. He's fermenting something, if you like. What do we need to watch for? What's changed? Well, I think we need to watch for Bannon's not going away. Um, Bannon's going to continue to push his agenda. He's going to push it through our elections that are coming up in November. Uh, I think he's going to push it on the international level. Um, really, in terms of the Trump White House, Trump very successfully used these elemental fears to help get himself elected, pitting us versus them. We've seen a growing segregation of our populations in the United States by community, by state. He played on that. He's playing on the immigration fears with building the wall, and he's playing out on the national security issue with his ban on uh, immigrants from Muslim So, so you would say that the fears have been stoked rather than allayed since the election of a man who said he would sort this out. Oh, absolutely. And, and he, again, uses the same kind of rhetoric, the fear rhetoric, the fear of the other, uh, as has been mentioned earlier by some of the other speakers, uh, and really using that very successfully. And again, I would emphasize to Paul's point, the know-nothings of the 19th century, the Red Scare of the 1920s, the rise of the KKK, that was endorsing national candidates in the 1920s, mm. that almost ran a candidate themselves, these are examples of yet another wave of this. And quite frankly, it's getting to the most elemental parts of do we stand by universal principles of human rights or is it about national identity, ethnic identity, religious identity? Okay, this is a question for, e for each one of you. Um, do it in whatever order you, you'd like. <laughs> if it is growing and if there is a reason why Steve Bannon et al. are behind it and it's becoming more international, what is the desired end product of this. Where do they think they're taking it? Destabilization of the European Union, destabilization of the European continent, destabilization of the political system. That that is Bannon's objective. And as 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 stated and with, with what in mind? What is what is the the thought process behind where this might lead? Well, as you said, mm. all of what you said to complete to create complete chaos and to also initiate a race war. Steve Bannon is a white supremacist. There is no denying this. Um, he, he's a very clever man. He knows exactly what he's doing. Um, and part of the, you know, this whole uh, inciting hate, inciting violence, is to do with racialized violence as well. Certainly in Europe, I think one of the things they're aiming to do is to try and overturn what they see as a, as a world order, at least that developed in Europe around mm. the 1968 and the kind of the sense of, you know, sort of left-wing um, um, uh, politics that grew and developed out of that. That's certainly a key reference point in a lot of European far-right literature that gets more So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a dis they despise the liberal order. Exactly. Uh, and want to see it replaced by 
what they might call a conservative order or something like that. And in some instances, it might be quite openly violent. If you look at somebody very extreme within this type of movement, like Anders Breivik, mm -hmm. uh, race war is talked about very there's openly. A, a great, Other people will talk about it in a much more coded very, way. Very there's, quick, a great quotation very from, there's a great quotation from Steve Bannon from a few years ago. He actually described himself as an anarchist, and he said that his intention was to bring the whole house down. Mm. Crikey. Quick final thought, Tom. Well, and I think what he's really ultimately about and what many of these are about is restoring their sense of what it means to be a great country and a great people. It's ethnically based, linguistically based, and politically it's about placing that identity as supreme, maybe allowing for others who look different to be part of that if they adhere to their rules, otherwise keeping them out, not interfering with their business in their own countries, but really this ultra-nationalism that says it's about us and what we think all should be one. And that, I'm afraid, is that. It's gone so very, very quickly. I should say in conclusion, besides thank you to each one of you for coming here, that perhaps the one thing I think we need to look out for, and thank you for all being aware of this um, far right watch, is, is the connections and to see where that might be taken internationally. Uh, from me, David Foster, from my guests, from the production team of Roundtable who made all of this possible, thank you for watching. We hope to have your company next time. Bye-bye.